Good evening. This is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon, the Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Ladies and gentlemen, the element of suspense is so vital to our story tonight that our sponsors, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, are omitting their usual commercial message during the intermission between the acts so that our play will go uninterrupted from spooky start to spooky finish. We of the Mercury reckon that a story doesn't have to appeal to the heart, it can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warm, sometimes you want your spine to tingle. Well, the tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to a classic among radio thrillers. Its author is one of the most gifted of all the writers who have ever worked for this medium, Lucille Fletcher, who wrote the greatest single radio script ever written. Sorry, wrong number. The title of this, her terrifying little tale of Gru, for this evening, is another spine tingler by name, The Hitchhiker. camp on Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, maybe it'll help me. It'll keep me from going crazy. But I must tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well. Perfectly well. Except that I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age, unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940... Ford V8, license number 6B7989. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I'm at this moment perfectly sane. That it is not me who's gone mad. But something else. Something utterly beyond my control. But I must speak quickly. Any moment the link with life may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on earth. The last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, mother. Here, give me a kiss, and then I'll go. I'll come out with you to the car. <laughs> ah, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Oh. Hey, what's this, tears? Oh, it's just the trip, Ronald. I wish you weren't driving. Oh, mother, there you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast. Or pick up any strangers now, on the road. Strangers? Don't you worry. There isn't anything going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a hot dog or a hamburger stand every ten miles. I was in excellent spirits. Drive ahead. Even the loneliness seemed like a lark. But I reckoned without him... Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. He stepped off the walk, and if I hadn't swerved, if I hadn't swerved, I'd have hit him. I almost did. Almost did hit him. Now, I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb, pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he'd got there, but I thought maybe one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beat me to the Skyway, and let him off. I didn't stop for him. Then, late that night, I saw him again. It was on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long at a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I could see him quite distinctly. The bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain spattered over his shoulders. He hailed me this time. Hello! Hello! I step 
blinked on the gas like a shot. That's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides, the coincidences, or whatever it was, gave me the willies. I stopped at the next gas station. Yes, sir. Fill her up, will you? Check your oil? No, thanks. Nice night, isn't it? Yes. yes. It, it uh, hasn't been raining here lately, has it? Not a drop of rain all week. Oh, no? I I suppose that hasn't done you business any harm. No, well, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, though. Ain't many pleasure cars out in the turnpike this season of the year. I guess not. What about hitchhikers? <laughs> hitchhikers here? Why, what's the matter? Don't you ever see any? A guy would be a fool to start out to hitchhike on this road. Look at it. Then you never see anybody? No. Nope. Maybe they get a lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it's a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't pick up a guy for that long a ride. This is pretty lonesome country here, mountains and woods. Yeah. Hey, you ain't seen nobody like that, have you? Oh, no, no. It's, it's just a <laughs> technical question. Oh, I see. Well, uh, that'll be a dollar forty-nine with the tax. <laughs> thing gradually passed from my mind as coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the man all next day until just outside of Zanesville, Ohio, I saw him again. It was a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble, lay dreaming in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, he was standing. Let me explain about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence, nor was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little the cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked... He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello! Hello! I'd stopped the car, of course, for the detour. For a few minutes, I couldn't seem to find the new road. I realized he must be thinking that I'd stop for him. Hello! No, oh, I'm... Not just now, I, I'm sorry. Going to California? No, no, not today. The other way, I, I, I'm going to New York. Sorry. Sorry. After I got the car back onto the road again, I felt like a fool. Yet the thought of picking him up, of having him sit beside me was somehow unbearable. Yet at the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. The fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The lights changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I, I caught myself searching the side of the road waiting for him to appear. Yep. What is it? What's going on? You sell sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yep, we do. In the daytime. But it closed up for the night. I know, but I was wondering if, if you could possibly may have a cup of coffee. Black coffee. Not at this time of night, mister. My wife's a cook and she's in bed. Well, now, l listen. Ju just a minute ago, there was a man standing here, right, right beside here, and... Oh, he was a suspicious-looking man. Henry? Who is it, Henry? It's nobody, Mother. She's a fan of things she wants a cup of coffee. Now, Go back in the bed. I, I don't mean to disturb you, but you see... <laughs> I, I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. What was he doing? Nothing. You've been hitting a bottle. That's, a, that's what's the matter with you. You got nothing better than do than wake decent folk out there hard and sleep. Now get going. Go on. But he, he, he looked as though he was going to rob you. I ain't got nothing in this stand to lose. 
Down your way before I call out chair folks. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop to rest a little, but... In the Ozark Mountains of Missouri, now, a few resort places there were closed. I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw him next, I'd run him down. But I didn't see him again until late the next afternoon. I'd stopped the car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma. Let a train pass by when he appeared across the tracks. He was leaning against a telephone pole. It was a perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't even look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, veering the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then, something went wrong with the car. It, it stalled right on the tracks. The train was coming closer. I could hear its bell. I heard its cry, its whistle crying. Still, he stood there. And now I knew that he was beckoning. Beckoning me to my death. time. The starter had worked at last. I managed to back up, but after the train had passed, he was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself be alone on the road for one minute. Hello there. Hello. Like a ride? What do you think? How far are you going? Amar- Amarillo. I'll, I'll, I'll take you to Amarillo. Amarillo, Texas? Yeah, I'll drive you there. Gee. Pop here. Mind if I take off my shoes? My dog's shoes. No, go right ahead. Oh, gee, what a break this is. Swell car and decent guy driving all the way to Amarillo. All I've been getting so far is trucks. You hitchhike much? Sure. Only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the brakes. Yeah, I think it would be, but I'll bet, though, you could, if, if, you, if you got a good pickup in a fast car, you could get to places faster than, what well, we'll say, another person in another car. I don't get you. Well, well you, you take me, for instance. Suppose I'm driving across the country at a nice steady clip of about 45 miles an hour. Couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road waiting for lifts beat me to town after town provided she got picked up every time in a car that was doing 65 or, or 70 miles an hour? I don't know. Maybe she could, maybe she couldn't. What difference does it make? No difference. It's just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. Oh, imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do if I was a good-looking fellow like yourself? I'd just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and relax. If I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road... Hey! Did you see him, too? That man, standing beside the barbed wire fence. I didn't see anybody. Right there. There was nothing, just a barbed wire fence. What did you think he was doing, trying to run into that barbed there wire fence? There was a man fence? there, I tell you. A, a thin, gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. I was trying to run him down. 
run him down. He may kill him. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of him. Or at least prove that he's real. But you, you say you didn't see him back there. You sure? I didn't see a soul. As far as that's Well, watch for him. Watch him the next time. And keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe any minute now. There! Look there! <laughs> I'm getting out of here. Did you see him that time? Did you no. see him? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. And I don't see how I will very long driving no, on look, you. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what came over me. Please, don't go. So if you'll excuse Please, me, Please, you mister. can't go. Listen, how'd you like to go to California? I'll drive you all the way to California. You think elephants all the way? No, thanks. Listen, please, just one minute. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend. Just a good dose of sleep. There, I cut it now. No. No, you can't go. Lay your hands on the lady here. Lay your hands on the Come back here, please. Come back. She ran from me. As if I was... some kind of monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then... That I was utterly alone. I was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get a hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car, just a few hours and sleep, just along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket. Just as a blanket. When I saw him coming toward me. Coming toward me. Emerging from the herd of moving steer. And I didn't wait for him to come any closer. Maybe. Maybe I should have spoken to him then. Fought it out then and there for. Now he began to be everywhere. Whenever I stopped even for a minute for gas, for oil, for a drink of pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich, he was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. He was standing near the drinking fountain, a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque where I bought ten gallons of gas. I was afraid now. Afraid to stop. I began to drive faster and faster. I was in... in lunar landscape now. The great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. Well, now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads. He waited for me. And every other mile. I'd see his figure. Shadowless. Flitting before me. Still in its same attitude. Over the cold and lifeless ground. Flitting over dried up rivers over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in the pure and cloudless air. and asked if there was a telephone. I, I had the feeling that if I could speak to somebody familiar, somebody that I loved, I could pull myself together. Number, please. Long distance. Thank you. This is long distance. 
I'd like to put in a call to my home to Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> I'm Ronald Adams. The number is Beechwood 9970. Thank you. Thank you. What is your number? My number? It's, it's, it's 312. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. New York. Gallup, New Mexico, calling a Beachwood Nyan Nyan. Better know. I'd read somewhere that love could banish demons. It was in the middle of the morning. I knew Mother'd be home. I pictured her tall, white haired, in her crisp house dress going about her tasks. It would be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit three dollars and eighty five cents for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right. Deposit another dollar and a half. Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Hello? This is Adams' residence. Hello. Hello, Mother? This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to? What? Please? Who is this? This is Mrs. Whitney. Mrs. Whitney? I, I don't know any Mrs. Whitney. Is this Beechwood 9970? Yes. Where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The, the hospital? Yes. Who is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? What's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated for five days. A nervous breakdown. Nervous. Who is this calling? Nervous breakdown. My mother is never... It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Since the death of her oldest son, Ronald? Hey, what is this? What number is this? This is Beechwood 9970. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Sir, your three minutes are up. And so, I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. And so I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm trying to get a hold of myself. Otherwise, otherwise I'll go crazy. Outside, it is night. The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me, stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa, and mountains, prairies, desert. Somewhere among them, he is waiting for me. Somewhere. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who. I am.
Now, here is Orson Welles. Well, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we bring to your radio another Mercury favorite. We hope a favorite of yours. You've asked for it many times. We've performed it many times. Jane Eyre. And Jane will be played by a Mercury actress who was heard tonight and has been heard so often on our shows. One of the most gifted people we know in our business, Miss Alice Frost. Jane Eyre then, with Alice Frost and your obedient servant, that's the same time next week, same station. Please join us. Until then, speaking for my sponsors, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, for all of us on the Mercury Theater, including Bernard Herman, who wrote and conducted the music on this program, I remain, as always, obediently yours. Mm-hmm.